Good morning and welcome back to part two of my big acrylic outdoor sign build. In the last episode, we did the big engrave on the black acrylic. I've got three other colors of acrylic to finish the sign. So we're gonna prep that acrylic, get it into the Nova Plus, get them cut and get the sign put together. Because we're only gonna be cutting today, I've removed the honeycomb out of the bed. We're gonna cut on the blade table. And I've removed the six millimeter tip and replaced it with a three millimeter cutting tip on the bottom of the laser head. My mirrors and my lens are clean. I've already calibrated and checked my air assist for proper pressure. And we're using the two and a half inch lens. So let's finish that build today on LaserNug. We're gonna be using three different colors of acrylic. And before we begin, I'm gonna to need to prep them with some adhesive. A few of you might be wondering why I'm using the 367 MP from 3M instead of using dual tight. As I mentioned in part one, this sign is for outdoor use only. It's gonna be sitting in a very harsh environment. In fact, an environment that reaches negative 40 degrees in the wintertime, and in fact, sometimes exceeds it or gets even colder than that. This dual tight is a great product for indoor use only. It's not rated to be used outdoors or in cold temperatures. However, your 467 MP, as well as your 9448A made by 3M, if you check the specs online, you'll see that it's made for both indoor and outdoor use, and it maintains its adhesion down to negative 40 degrees. So this was the clear winner today. Now that our materials are all prepped and ready to go, let's jump into light burn. So in the interest of your sanity and the length of this video, I'm not gonna take you step by step through every single thing I do on this part to create these templates. There are a number of different videos where I've done this before on my channel, but I do want to take you through the highlights. But before I touch this design, I'm going to duplicate it. I'm going to make a duplicate and put it off to the side. If you look closely, you can kind of see the edge of it on the left hand side of your screen. That way, if I mess anything up or move anything by accident, I've got a fresh duplicate that I can go back to to start again. From there, what I want to do right now is I need to make my templates out of MDF. I use 1 16th MDF for that, as you know. And in order to create those templates, I have to create rectangles around each of the words or the set of words or characters. Whenever I create a template, I always try to find an anchor point or a reference point. And in this case, it's the 24 by 36 inch outline or tool layer, because that's the size of the piece. And I want to make sure that when I drag that template or create those rectangles around each of those positionings for those words or characters, that I'm able to get the rectangle to line up to at least one side so that I know that when I go to put the sign together or I do the build, I have an exact reference to ensure that those letters end up exactly where they're supposed to in the design. If all I did was create a rectangle, create the template, then I'd have to start taking measurements to try to figure out where to put the letters. This way, if I create the rectangle, snap it to grid, along one or more edges, then I know exactly where it's gonna fit because I just tape it to the edge. The other thing I wanted to point out is when you are creating that rectangle in order to create your cutout, you wanna make sure that the rectangle is centered around the words and not the other way around. And what I mean by that is that if you were to take, highlight your words, press and hold your shift, then highlight the rectangular box you made and go up to your target or your centering command, when you click that, it's going to move the letters around to be in the center of the rectangle. What I want is I want the rectangle to be centered around where the words are so the words don't move. And in order to do that, you just simply do the reverse. In Lightburn, whenever you wanna center something, whatever you click first is going to be what Lightburn knows or thinks you wanna center. Once I've created my boxes or my rectangles around those specific sets of words or the relative words, I group them and now I start to move them into position and I change layer colors, in this case for my MDF for cut layers. And once I'm done and I come back in here and I need to start cutting my acrylic, I can then remove the rectangles and just start cutting out the letters. And you'll see here, I try to move them around in such a manner as I can get the most efficient cut out of that physical piece of MDF. And as the old saying goes, measure twice, cut once. So I want to make sure or double check I have the right settings in this case for MDF and then later for acrylic. And I always grab my group and then I check my preview window 
to make sure it's exactly what I expect or what I need to cut out. So hey, while we're watching the engrave, for you folks that have just started up your laser business, I wanted to offer out a few suggestions and by all means, just something for you to consider. When you're doing um, piece work, so to speak, or you're, you're making or engraving units, uh, whether they're keychains, tumblers, doesn't matter what it is, but it's kind of unit based. You can do your quotations and your invoicing based, you know, on units. Perhaps somebody wants to order a dozen travel mugs and they want their logo on there. So you'll send your proposal back that says this model or type of tumbler, three by four inch logo engraved, and you've got usually, at least in my case, I don't charge separately for different pieces. I just have an all in kind of this is how much per tumbler. It says very simply, X many units at this price equals Y amount. I've got my tax in there. You're gonna add your shipping, of course, and you can go onto any one of the shippers and do one of their online tools to get an exact quote on what the shipping is gonna cost. And you can send them the proposal and you invoice the same way. Not a lot of details, but here's how many units at this price. You may choose to do add de design fees, you may choose to do it by hours, but the important thing is generally your invoicing or your quotation first and then your subsequent invoicing is going to be pretty defined and it's more or less unit based. If they've got a large number, you probably have a discount at certain volumes, but it's pretty straightforward. So all my templates are cut out. Now that that's complete, I'm just gonna go back into Lightburn. I'm gonna change my settings to my acrylic settings and I'm gonna start cutting out those numbers and letters. Usually when I'm cutting acrylics, I'll usually cut with the adhesive side down, unless I'm using a row mark like a color cast product where you're supposed to flip it, reverse your image and cut it with the top. I'm just gonna square up my piece with the gantry, autofocus and fire it up. Unlike more or less a unit based type cost, you've got a customized creation. Uh, of whatever size and whatever complexity. So in those cases, I don't itemize out by line item the price or cost for each of the materials, adhesives, laser time, my time, etc. I identify what the customer is gonna get and what they wanna to agree to. In this case, 3 8 acrylic, two foot by three foot, a couple of pieces of different colored acrylic, the adhesives. I identify what goes into the build, but I don't separate the costs by supply or material or my time separately. I give them an all in price. And I think it's important that you don't want to try your best to line item everything because that opens up different discussions, i.e. say I put out and I decided to line item my two foot by three foot acrylic and it's $150. The customer can come back to me and go, well, you know, if you bought it from some other supplier I saw online, you could get that acrylic for $110. And you end up going down the wrong route of the discussion. The discussion is around the customer has a budget, you're going to build to that budget, and here's my all-in cost, here's the components you're gonna receive. I'm also gonna send a mock-up of the design from Lightburn, and I wanna make sure that the customer understands exactly what they're getting and signs off on exactly what I'm going to build for them. You're gonna need a deposit. A build like this, for example, is not cheap. So generally, I'll ask the customer for at least a 50% deposit up front. And that way, if anything goes awry during the build uh, with the customer, maybe they change their mind two weeks later, you are now not stuck with hundreds of dollars of supplies that you can't use anymore. So you wanna make sure that for the customer's benefit, it confirms their confidence or their decision that they do wanna go forward. And that deposit also protects you. And either you're gonna at least charge a deposit to cover your materials that you've had to buy, or in my case, generally I, I ask for a 50% deposit. And my shipping is estimated as well as my taxes because when you've got something this heavy and this large, it's difficult to try to find an exact quote online because I quite honestly don't know what the total all in weight is gonna be of this package. I hope that's helpful.
So hey, other than a final clean and some shipping, we're all wrapped up here. I think it turned out beautifully. I've already sent pictures to the customer. He thinks it's awesome, which is great. A couple of final words on the sign and the colors I used here. The white on black, I think, really allows that phone number specifically to pop. So as I discussed with the customer, I wanted to make sure that we had really sharp contrasts in the colors, especially with the phone number. Because anybody driving by is going to want to take their eye right to the phone number. It's kind of short of the name. It's pretty much the most important piece on the sign. I really appreciate you folks sticking around for the two-part build. If you're new to lasers or you're just starting up that side business, I've got a few final thoughts I'd be happy to share with you if you've got a few more minutes for me. Why don't we jump back inside? If your business is starting or growing similar to mine, you're probably finding that most or at least a large portion of the sales you're making, as infrequent as they may be for the first while, are largely either referrals or repeat business from people that you've already done work for. And so another idea in addition to any type of advertising you may pay for or work you do in trying to get your name out there, whether it's on social media, the internet, your community bulletin board, different groups or church groups, etc., is provide a little bit of product back to your customers. So as an example, in this case, this business bought a sign for me, but I want them to know I do more than just signs. So in addition to sending them the sign, I also took his logo, did a couple of hats for him, made a couple of keychains, and I also engraved a tumbler for him, a wine tumbler. And I'm gonna send those, and those are from me to him. And the purpose of that is I want him and his business to know that I do more than just signs. And I want him to see a few samples, because he may need merch one day, whether he needs it today or a year from now. Or more importantly, a lot of your small or your medium-sized customers will often belong to either their local chamber of commerce or some other business association or have other affiliations. So if they're happy with the sign, they might be sitting at the Chamber of Commerce meeting two months from now and one of the other business owners in the community says, you know what, I need to invest in some merch. I think I'm gonna get some hats done. Now you've got somebody who's happy with the work you've done the first time and they now know that you do hats or tumblers or any type of drinkware. Another example, this business in particular does heavy equipment rentals as well as sells firewood. He probably has a lot of repeat customers that rent from him regularly. So he may, for example, at Christmas, want to send out some type of a Christmas decoration or a holiday wish to all of his regular customers. And I need him to know that I can put those ornaments together for him. So for me, this is an investment back in the business. As far as you know, my accounting, these are marketing and advertising costs, just the same as if I did Facebook ads. But I capture them or account for them this way. What I don't do is I don't inflate my profit margin in order to cover these costs. These are separate expenses. And usually I'll decide or choose what type of samples to send based on discussions with the customer and what they do or what I think might be helpful for them in the future. So hey, thank you so much for sticking around for the two-parter. I hope there was some information in there that you might find helpful, especially if you're just starting out with the Nova Plus or heck, any laser for that matter. Please be kind to each other. And don't forget to have fun with your laser. I'm Gord Potter, and you've been watching Laser Nike. Cheers.